Hello, everyone, and welcome to the chapter on definite integrals. So first, a small remark. Definite integrals initially have nothing to do. They have nothing to do with indefinite integrals. Of course, the terminology, so if we say definite integral or indefinite integral, sounds very similar, or even the notation that we'll see in a moment are very, very close. But if you don't know how to compute families of antiderivatives, you can talk about different integrals, no problem. Of course, of course, there is a link between the two of them. And that link, you will see, we will see it in that section called the first fundamental theorem of calculus. But anyways, let's talk about definite integrals first. In this section, we will first see an informal definition of the definite integral. This informal definition should really be intuitive in the sense that it's going to use ideas coming from basic geometry. But at some point, we will have the true definition, the formal definition of the definite integral. But you need to really understand what is the definite integrals through this informal definition first in order to define it correctly and eventually compute it correctly. The informal definition of the definite integral is the following. We start with a function, whoa, well, big surprise, over an interval a, b. So those two things are given to us, like the function f and the interval is specified in any definite integral question. So what is the definite integral of f of x over that interval? Well, it's simply the area under the graph f of x over the interval a, b. So here in my picture, I have that area shaded in gray, and I call that region s. s is for surface. The notation for the definite integral goes as follows. So we use the integral symbol. So the function f of x is given so we have the function here so we have the graph of our function f of x so the function f of x goes inside this integral symbol and then the surface that we are interested the area of the surface that we are interested in starts at a so we call a the lower bound of integration and it goes all the way up to b which we call also the upper bound of the integral so a is the lower bound b is the upper bound and we're looking for that surface under F over the interval AB. That's the definite integral. So the first thing to notice in that definition, even if there's a lot of notation, so just a small remark here I want to add up, that definite integral is just a number. So the integral from A to B of F of X is a number. So when you are asked to compute the definite integral, the answer at the end is a number. So you have to be very careful because when you look at the indefinite integral, so I'll write this as another remark here, the indefinite integral of a function is a family of primitives. So it's a lot. So those two objects are very, very different. Definite integral is just a number, indefinite integral, is a family of functions. So it's, it's very, very different. But of course, the notation is very, very similar. The, dif the difference between the notation is that if you don't see any lower bound and upper bound on your integral, then you're talking about an indefinite integral. But if you have bounds from A to B, then you're talking about a definite integral and you're expected to compute a number. The next remark is about the actual definition here of the definite integral and the distinction between computing a definite integral and actually computing the area of a surface. Because in geometry, when you are asked to compute the area, it's always going to be a positive quantity. In this definition, the definite integral is actually a signed area. What I mean by this is that if the region is above the x-axis, we will consider this region to be a positive area, but if the region is under the x-axis, it's going to be considered 
a negative area. So when you are computing the different integral, it is possible that the answer is negative. So there is a difference between computing the area of a region and computing the definite integral. So it is possible to get negative values when you're computing definite integrals. A couple of properties um, follows directly from this definition that are very important for us, and we'll be using these properties. So the first property is a trivial one. If you're computing the definite integral from A to A, so you're looking at a, an area over a point, well, this area is always going to be uh, considered to be zero. So the definite integral from A to A of f of x dx is zero. So that's the first property. The second one is a very important one. So that one, we are going to use it a lot uh, in order to compute various definite integrals. So if you have like numbers, let's say A smaller than B smaller than C, suppose F is defined over AC, then if you are computing the definite integral from A to C, well, you can break it into two sub definite integrals, one from A to B, and then the second one from B to C. So the definite integral from A to C of f of x dx is the integral, the definite integral from A to B of f of x dx plus the definite integral from B to C of f of x dx. And again, here with a picture, you can see that the full region over AC is going to be equal to the region over AB plus the region over BC. And in that notation, what's really important here is when you look at the sum on the right side, the upper bound of the first definite integral needs to match the lower bound of the second definite integral in order to have this flow from A all the way up to C. And it does not matter what B is in between A and C. You can always do that. This is a very useful property because sometimes when you have to compute a definite integral and the region is complicated, it's easier just to break it into smaller pieces and then just compute these areas of those smaller pieces and then just add them up together for the full region. The third property is a bit a crazy one, but it will be a useful one later when we're going to talk about the second fundamental term of calculus, uh, you are allowed to flip bounds. So if you have an integral from a, b for a function f of x, you can flip them. You can go from b to a, but you need to multiply your answer by minus one. So um, typically the reason why we use this property is if for some reason in some of our computations, we end up with a different integral where the lower bound is a bigger number, then instead of freaking out, you just say, well, I can just flip my bounds, but I need to remember that I need to multiply my answer by minus one. Let's just do a quick example to get familiar with the notation of definite integrals. So suppose we know that the definite integral for f of x between one and nine is seven, that the definite integral between five and nine is for f of x is minus three, Let's figure out what is the definite integral for f of x between 1 and 5. And I must confess here, a lot of notation, but I typically like to do these questions just by using intervals. What I mean by this is that I know initially I have this interval from 1 to 9. So I just draw an interval from 1 to 9. Here we go. So, or wait a minute. Here we go. So, boom. Okay, here's my interval from 1 to 9. And I know the definite integral between 1 and 9 is 7. Okay, so the area under the curve for f of x. And you don't need to actually know what f of x is. We just know that there's a region of 7. And now basically what we're doing is we're breaking this interval 1, 9 into two sub-intervals from 1 to 5 and from 5 to 9. So here I'm going to just draw again that interval but broken into pieces. So here we go. So here we go, boom. Okay, so now that's the same interval from one to five and from five to nine. And I know that the definite integral from five to nine is minus three. So I'm just going to write minus three here between five and nine. And basically what we want to know is what is the definite integral between one and five. And now using the, the second property of the definite integral, 
we want some shit plus minus three equal to seven. Uh, well, of course, okay, this is going to be equal to 10. Okay, so it's not that difficult. Okay, so, he, but now I'm just going to write this properly. So using the notation of the definite uh, integrals. So when you're writing this down correctly, always start with the biggest definite integral, the one with the longest interval. So here I know the integral the definite integral between 1 and 9 of f of x dx. So is going to be equal. So I have my larger definite integral. And then I have two other ones, one from 5 to 9 and the other one from 1 to 5. So you, your first definite integral should be the one with the same lower bound as the lower bound between 1 and 9. So this is going to be equal to the definite integral between 1 and 5 f of x dx. And then the next one needs to start at 5. So remember when you're combining two definite integrals, the upper bound of the left definite integral needs to coincide with the lower bound of the right one. So here, this is going to be uh, plus the definite integral between 5 and 9 of f of x dx. Now I know that these three definite integrals are combined correctly. And in these questions, this is very typical, you know, two of the definite integral and one of them is missing. So here on the left side, I know the definite integral is seven. On the right side, I don't know what's the definite integral between one and five. So that's actually the question. And then what we wanna do, and then we have to go plus the second one and the definite integral between five and nine is minus three. And now if I just isolate that, so I just bring the plus three on the other side, I just get that 10 is equal to my definite integral. Boom. Et voila. Okay, so here I have my 10. But again, here, a lot of notation uh, for something fairly simple. Okay, if you can kind of visualize what's going on using intervals, some people like to do like a rough sketch for f of x and then just divide the regions accordingly using the second properties, property, sorry, of definite integral. Uh, you can figure out uh, what's going on with. Um, these uh, different integrals. Anyways, too much talking. Let's look at the other example that is really, really important. For our next example, we have a function f of x, and it's defined over the interval from minus 1 to 6. And we need to compute a bunch of definite integrals. So when I do these questions, the first thing I do is I always break the um, different integrals into pieces where I can compute the areas very quickly. Like for example, here between minus one and zero, I have a square, the area of that square is one. Between zero and one, I have a right triangle where the base and the height is one, are one. So the area is going to be one times one divided by two, so it's 0 0.5, or you can just see it's half of a tile here, so it's area of 0 0.5. Uh, now between 1 and 2, I have again a right triangle, basis 1, height is 2, 1 times 2 divided by 2, the area is going to be 1. Of course, if you think about it as definite integral, you can say that the definite integral is minus 1, but normally when I do these things, I like to just write the areas and then just think about them as being positive or negative afterwards. It does not matter. So here, I'm kind of using a color scheme where all my green regions are going to be positives and all my red regions are going to be negative. So here between two and three, same right triangle area is one, definite integral is minus one. Between three and four, same triangle again. So here area is going to be one. Between four and five, I have a square plus half of a square. So area of 1.5. And finally, between five and six, I have another a square of area one. And now that I have all those definite integrals, I mean, those areas, computing those different integrals are going to be just a question of combining these areas correctly. So for example, the definite integral between minus 1 and 1 for f of x dx, I'm just going to go 1 plus 0 0.5 and get 1.5. The definite integral between 1 and 3, I have those two right triangles below the x-axis, so it's 1 plus 1, but both of them are under, so I'm just going to write minus 2. Now, for example, if I want the definite integral from minus 1 to 3, I can basically just use the two numbers that I freshly computed before, 1.5 minus 2, that's minus 0 0.5. 
Now, if I want the different integral between three and four, okay, that's just one right triangle of area one. It's above the x-axis. So the different integral is plus one between three and five. It's the right triangle plus that trapezoid. So one plus 1.5, you get 2.5. And then finally, if I want the full different integral from minus one to six, if I go one plus 0.5, minus one, minus one, plus one, plus 1.5, plus one, all of that is going to be equal to three. So again, when you're computing different integral, and if you have a function like this one, which is kind of nice because it's all defined visually where the graph itself is a bunch of lines, use basic geometry to compute area of surfaces, but there's a twist here. Make sure that you understand that the areas above the x-axis are all positive and the areas below the x-axis are all negative. And then just combine them using that second property to compute any of those definite integrals. I want to end this section with a nice remark that questions why this section is called informal definition for the definite integral. And uh, the reason why this is an informal definition is that in general, it's very difficult to compute different integrals. The reason why our previous example was not too difficult is because when we were looking at those regions between the graph and these intervals, we were able to compute these areas using basic geometry because all the regions were either rectangles, triangles, or trapezoids. So things coming from basic geometry. But now here I have an example of a different integral that is easy to visualize, but extremely difficult to compute. Like here I have the function x squared, our good old basic quadratic equation over the interval zero four. So we see what is the different integral. We see it's going to be a positive area because, or a positive different integral because the area is above the x-axis, but how do you compute this area, this pink region here? How are you going to compute this? This is not a triangle. This is not a rectangle. This is not, even if you are dealing with circles or ellipsoid, a quadratic is a different shape. So here you cannot use anything coming from basic geometry to compute this area. So even if it's easy to visualize, it's extremely difficult to compute and maybe impossible to compute. So we'll have to find ways to first define exactly how to compute this area and then, of course, compute it using uh, different tools coming from calculus, of course. So we're going to go beyond geometry using the tools of calculus. Anyways, for that section, that's it. That's all. Bye, Le.